You're listening to On Shifting Ground. I'm Ray Suarez. President Biden and President Xi's meeting in San Francisco has made the headlines across the Pacific. But most policy negotiations happen behind the scenes and draw little attention or scrutiny. The reason? The stakes are usually not all that great. But what happens when a negotiation will determine the fate of a country? We're going to share an excerpt from Foreign Policy's acclaimed podcast, The Negotiators, hosted by Jen Williams. It's a story about a disputed Kenyan presidential election in 2008. The violence in Kenya's Rift Valley region is spreading quite fast. At least 600 people have been killed in riots and ethnic killings following last month's disputed presidential election. And how former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, stepped into the political crisis to play the role of mediator. I want to say how happy we are to be here. It is a difficult challenge in assignment. One of the people who helped Anand in the negotiation was Meredith Preston McGee. She worked in Nairobi at the time for a nonprofit that mediates conflicts around the world, the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Preston McGee was in Kenya on election day. She and her husband traveled to a remote cottage in the country's Rift Valley. The next day, she was waiting for election results to be announced on the radio. The counting started to slow down, and we weren't getting as many regular reports of updates. There was a few hours of a bit of a blackout of information. And then when the counting resumed, the incumbent, President Kabaki, was significantly ahead of the opposition candidate, Raila Odinga. And so it was a quick flip in the results after several hours of not receiving results. And as you can imagine, people started to ask questions. I got a phone call from a friend in Nairobi, and he said, something's not right. I think you should come home. Meredith Preston McGee is our point of view in this story. She shares how Kofi Annan approached the negotiation of a political settlement in Kenya. She told her story to Foreign Policy's senior producer, Laura Rosbro Tellum. And so we packed up the car early and drove from Nakuru to Nairobi, which is a few hours drive. And usually there's a lot of matatus on the road. There's a lot of traffic and so forth. Nobody was on the road. We saw one matatu. It was the fastest I've ever driven that road. Everyone was proverbially glued to their radios. Friends of mine didn't heed my other friend's advice and came back about four or five hours later, and they hit violent protests in almost every town that they drove through along the same route that I had driven in complete silence as everyone was waiting for the results. And in that space of time, that sort of five or six hour window, the elections commissioner had come on the radio after having sort of disappeared from public view for a while, had expressed unease about the counting and the tallying, and then had declared President Kabaki to be the winner. By the time I got back to Nairobi, preparations were already underway for a swearing-in ceremony of the president. And as you can imagine, normally, as we see in many places, you have your election, you finalize your election, and weeks later, the president is sworn in. So there was this very hasty swearing-in ceremony, and already we began to see the violence erupting in the Rift Valley, where I had just come from, but also in some of the informal settlements in Nairobi and in other places across the country. So with the really rapid onset of the violence, we saw a huge number of high-level delegations sort of descend on Nairobi with different offers to try to mediate, to try to calm the violence, to try to begin a process in order to address the crisis. The United Nations was involved, the World Bank, the United States, several African leaders from across the continent came and went. And you have to remember that these first weeks, the violence was still escalating, and none of these offers of negotiation really landed. But that's not totally unusual in a peacemaking perspective. I would argue that that first period, the 
situation wasn't ripe yet for the parties to sit down at the table. But the African Union stepped in, and their chair, the president of Ghana, John Kufour, laid the groundwork for Kofi Annan to begin the negotiation process. Annan at this point was based in Geneva. He boarded a plane, and we were all awaiting his arrival in Kenya in the hopes that talks would begin very, very quickly. Anand fell ill on the tarmac quite dramatically before the plane took off and was hospitalized for a couple of days. But what it meant was that there was a week's delay in his arrival. And now while that may have been in the moment it felt like a setback, Anand didn't sit idly by for the week in which he was recovering. He was on the phone regularly, both shoring up international support for a mediation behind his leadership, so really ensuring that he was going to be the only game in town. But also talking to a number of key leaders around the world and across the continent and in Kenya to understand the depths of the crisis and the situation. And so the other advantage of, that this week gave was Anand was able to build some support for his process, but also to deepen his own understanding and therefore strategic thinking about the direction that the process would need to go once he got on the ground. In that intervening week before Anand arrived, also the elections for the Speaker of Parliament took place and the opposition overwhelmingly controlled parliament and won both the Speaker of Parliament and the Deputy Speaker. And so you saw almost a political slight shift in the balance of power because while the ruling party, if I can call them that, controlled state house, the opposition party now controlled parliament. And so you had more of a governance standoff than you'd had before. And it made it harder for the government to use a sort of business as usual, everything's under control narrative with the mediators when Anan finally arrived a week later. Kofi Annan was meant to arrive on the 16th of January. This was delayed until the 22nd of January when the panel did arrive. They then immediately held meetings both with Rilo Dinga and with President Mwai Kibaki, and then with a range of other key figures to establish the mediation process. So I had received a call from my boss at the time, who is Martin Griffiths, the executive director for the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Martin's wife was Anand's chief of staff. Martin, as you know now, of course, is the head of UN OCHA. The call was essentially to be on standby, to be seconded, to work for Kofi Annan and the team to do anything they needed us to do. As you can imagine, in the first days, there was a huge amount of movement going on. Meetings being set, the location being established, the back offices for Annan and the panel being set up. And I sort of got thrust into all of this. I was brought up into uh, one of the upper hallways of the Serena Hotel, where we were utilizing a number of the suites as rooms for meeting. And I was just standing along the hallway, kind of waiting to be called on. And Mr. Anand walked past and he just paused and he turned around and he said, oh, I don't believe we've met. And it's so funny when I think about style as a mediator, is that Things were chaotic often and fast, and it was this high-powered go, go, go. But he could take these elegant moments of pause and just be lovely and very human and very personal. And I think that that was another facet of how he engaged as a mediator that was really important. Anand's first meetings with the parties were really to establish, first of all, the process itself, the parameters for the process, what kind of structure that was going to take, 
and then really critically the agenda for the process, which was the first really item on the on the discussions. But importantly, Anand negotiated a few really core elements in those first rounds of talks. He did not see a process by which Kabaki and Ryla met directly as the core process. So he requested high-level, empowered delegations on both sides. And this gave him some maneuverability. These people could be full-time in the talks, whereas the leader of the opposition and the president were never going to be. It gave Anan and the panel an opportunity to escalate things when the parties got deadlocked and to be able to utilize channels to the two principles and to be able to create some kind of sense of connection across the table between the two teams. The negotiating teams were small. There was four delegates on each team plus one technical resource person. And there was one woman of the four in each. The government delegation was headed by a woman. Anand was also very, very clear that he was going to speak to the press and that there was going to be transparency of the process. So that was really critical in the early days of the negotiations. So in the first couple of days where the parties were now sitting together, we had a conference room in the Serena Hotel in the basement of the Serena Hotel on the lower ground floor. And Anan and Grasa and Prism Kappa were at one end. We had Hansard level note takers from the UN, so everything was being f- properly recorded. And we had the parties to the table. And I was sort of perched on the corner, providing some additional notes and support to Anan. The first two items on the agenda were deliberately designed to get rapid progress and momentum for the talks. So the first two agenda points were measures to stop the violence and how to address the humanitarian situation. Anand felt that momentum was particularly important as a measure to demonstrate to Kenyans that there was real progress in the talks and therefore hopefully reduce some of the violence that was continuing across the country. Now, the note takers from the UN were mandated to really take down everything everyone said. And so asking them to synthesize and do that was simply not possible. And so I began doing some of the synthesization of those first agreements for the parties. And we were able to do that in real time in the room. And so while the emotion was very high, there was also a sense of fairly rapid progress around those first two agenda items. One of the things that I think was really critical for this process was when Anan arrived, one of the other pieces that he negotiated with the parties or was clear with the parties about was that he was going to take some time to speak to the people of Kenya. What we saw was rather tragic. Uh, We visited several IDP camps. We saw people pushed from their homes, from their farms, grandmothers, children, families uprooted and I think it is important that all Kenyans respond with sympathy and understanding and not try to revenge. And so about two, maybe three days of consultations were established where he and the members of the panel met with faith leaders, traditional leaders, other political parties, youth leaders, women leaders, non-governmental organizations, other peacemaking and human rights organizations across Kenya, ambassadors from across the African region, editors and media personalities, and a number of other eminent persons across Kenya. And this was from early, early morning until late in the evening, often more than 100 people crammed into the room. And the panel listened to what they had to say. They had leverage from these conversations where Kenyan leaders from all different spaces and all different political stripes had really said, these are deeper, more consequential issues that really require that we have long-term issues and solutions. And so that really birthed what became known as Agenda 4 
on the process, which was how you deal with some of these bigger structural issues that had been at the roots of the conflict. The other thing this did was it set Anand up as having a sort of relationship with the Kenyan people. And he and the panel utilized a relationship with Kenya more widely to leverage different points of the process throughout. And these consultations were one of the first spaces in which they did this. So on those first couple of days, there was a degree of collaborative space because these were issues that both parties did want to show some momentum on. So Anan is an, a phenomenal chair, and so the parties would be talking with one another. And what I was trying to do was trying to take pieces from both sides and synthesize it into a paragraph of what I thought everyone was saying. The negotiations were being held up by many complexities, but ultimately, any agreement would come down to one thing, a power-sharing agreement. Some parties believed power-sharing might be unconstitutional, so it became a major sticking point in the talks, but Anan was undeterred. Anan tried several different things, including the international pressure, but also they established essentially a legal committee where they were trying to work through some of the definitions around what it would look like if you were going to have power sharing. What would it mean to have the powers of a in cabinet? What would consultations look like? How would you do those sorts of things? And so again, trying to bring it back to that technical space that was begun within this week, but again, hadn't made that much progress. And so then, again, thinking about some of the earlier pieces that Anand had put in place, he was speaking regularly to the public. He was engaging regularly with the media editors and ensuring that the narrative to the Kenyan public was really to encourage support for the process and for his mediation. And today we have had very constructive and really accelerated talks. And I'm very, very pleased with the progress we are making. He then really brought in the power of the parliamentary leadership. You had a Speaker of Parliament who, while he came from the opposition, was a widely respected figure on both sides. And the Speaker of Parliament worked closely with Anan to come up with an approach that's known in Kenya as a kamakunji, which, if I'm translating it correctly, is essentially a special session of parliament. And so they convened a special session of parliament at which Anan and Grasa Michelle, I believe President Kappa, had had to step away at this point. They addressed parliament and essentially made their pitch for what a grand coalition government could look like for Kenya and how that could happen with the support of parliament. Because to do so, there would need to be some sort of constitutional amendment. And that required two-thirds support in parliament. And so you needed parliamentary support. The Kamakunji speech, of course, was nationally broadcast as well. So this was another opportunity for Anand to speak to the people of Kenya, but to really leverage the legislature as a mechanism for pressure. We agree but that to be in the interest of everyone to establish an independent review committee to investigate all aspects of the 2007 presidential election. Following the speech in the Kamakunji and knowing that the parties were deadlocked, we had already made preparations to take the parties away to a retreat. What happened at the retreat? Did they resolve the deadlock? Find out after the break. You're listening to On Shifting Ground, produced by World Affairs in San Francisco. This week, we're sharing an episode from the third season of Foreign Policy's The Negotiators, hosted by Jen Williams. Before the break, Kofi Annan and the parties in Kenya were at an impasse in the election talks. So they decided to change the setting, a common tactic in peace negotiations. Meredith Preston McGee was in the room, and she takes us through the rest of the story. One of the dynamics that we were seeing in the week before the Kamakunji is that we would make a little bit of progress in the room, and overnight that progress would be clawed back. 
And there was a feeling that there were maybe more hardline voices that weren't in the room that were pulling back the delegations every night. And we felt like we needed to bring everybody into a slightly more sequestered environment to see if we could make progress. So on February 12th, immediately following the speech on the Grand Coalition to the Kamakunji, we were whisked off to an Air Force aircraft and flown to an undisclosed location. We went to a beautiful lodge in Savo, which is one of the um, game parks in Kenya. The airspace above the lodge was closed. And for about two days, I think it took two days for the location to be leaked. The headlines the next day in the Nation newspaper essentially were, where have they gone? And we were sequestered off in this lodge with the parties, with the technical teams, with Anan and his advisors, myself included, and with a couple of other really key technical advisors at this point. There were rounds of talks. There were times where the parties were in tete-a-tetes with their own technical teams, and they would come back. We were trying to get clues from both sides in terms of the things that they were discussing. They would leave crumpled up pieces of paper on the ground and we would unfurl them and see if we could glean what they were thinking of in terms of the powers of a potential prime minister, what it would mean to consult and how we would potentially break these deadlocks. And we inched forward on a couple of issues, but generally speaking, we didn't make the progress that we had wanted to in the retreat. And so we returned to Nairobi. I know that many of you have been eager to write the headline, we have a deal. But again, let me advise patience. I was feeling deeply frustrated. I think there was a feeling throughout the process of the weight of the country upon us and the weight of the violence. Some weeks earlier, there had been several particularly egregious crimes that had taken place in the Rift Valley. And I recall receiving the reports of those on a day when we weren't making much progress in the room and really feeling like the violence was a wildfire that was sweeping down and it was our job to stop it. And we didn't necessarily have the capacity to hold it back despite the fact that we had every tool in our disposal. So I think there was a real fear that we didn't have the same leverage. I would say, however, that Anan stayed the course throughout this and utilized different points of leverage at every moment and every step. And so thinking about having spoken to the special session of parliament Having laid down the gauntlet in several places, he gave a famous statement to the press where he said, I'm a prisoner of peace. The parties won't agree, but they won't let me leave. That he'd used all of this pressure, but he still had more that he could use and that he did. And so I think we all felt frustrated, but at the same time recognized that there was more that we could do because the process had been well structured and because we did have really deep support both across the country, across the region, and around the world. So coming back to Nairobi, Anan brought the parties together the next morning and said, have you made any progress since we left the retreat? And they said no. And he said, fine, then I'm suspending the talks. We're going to engage them in the hope that we will find a way of moving much faster than we have up till today. So the sessions are suspended for the moment. And he went and he had a tete-a-tete with each, with President Kabaki and with Raila Odinga. So in another fortunate coincidence, President Bush, who was president of the U.S. at the time, was on a state visit to Tanzania. And as ever, when a U.S. president is abroad, his secretary of state, Condoleezza Rice, was accompanying him on the state visit to Tanzania. Kofi Annan spoke with President Bush and said, I need U.S. support in this moment. And President Bush said, fine, I'm sending you Condi. Now, a State Department official who accompanied Condoleezza Rice when she came to Kenya remarked to me that this was the first time that a U.S. Secretary of State had stepped away from accompanying a U.S. president while abroad. This did not happen. 
So this in itself was a recognition of the importance with which the U.S. government took this and took their support. So Condoleezza Rice flies in. She comes directly to the Serena Hotel, and she sits in a tete-a-tete with Anand, with Anand's chief of staff at the time, Margaret Vogt, myself and a couple of advisors, and we just listened and talked through what the positions of the parties were and what leverage the U.S. could bring to bear in this moment. So after the discussions with Kofi Annan, Condoleezza Rice went and met with President Kabaki and his team, and then with Rilo Odinga and his team. Following that, we met, uh, Anan and myself and several of the advisors met with President Kabaki and some of his core team right after. And they were, I think, shaken by some of the pressure that had been leveraged on them by the United States. I frankly believe that the time for a political settlement was yesterday. It is really important that this be done and done urgently. It was equally clear that they couldn't simply capitulate hours after a meeting with Condoleezza Rice and say, well, obviously, because the U.S. said X, we're going to do Y. But what it did was it enabled Anand to utilize that leverage to get them back to a round of talks in order to conclude the power sharing agreement. But again, we were still deadlocked when the delegations were meeting. So rather than bring the delegations back together, Anand proposed that he would sit directly with President Kibaki and with Raila Odinga. Anand brought greater legitimacy to this meeting by inviting the then president of Tanzania, Jakaya Kikwete, and President Kappa, who had left the negotiations earlier, returned. Now there were five at the table. And on the 28th of February, early in the morning, the five of them entered the room of the office of the president with a draft of the agreement. I think we are at a very critical stage in the negotiations, and we need to focus on that. The solution must be found in the mediating room and the leaders engage in each other. But it, we have to move quickly and we have to reassure people as fast as we can. Several pieces of the agreement had been agreed and every piece of the agreement that was still in dispute had been placed in parentheses. And this was an approach that Hans Carell, the legal advisor, had worked with the lawyers in the legal technical working group of the talks to say, okay, well, we've agreed these pieces, so let's put them down on paper and we'll just bracket anything that we don't agree, which is a really clever legal technique. And so Anan, with the other four, sat in the room and went through each parentheses to see if they could get agreement on each one. At this point, the agreement was close hold between the five of them in that room and I had a draft of it on my computer. And they would spend a couple of hours in the talks, and then Anand would come out with a piece of paper. He and I would go into a separate room. He would get me to make certain changes that had been agreed. We would shred the one piece of paper, destroy one piece of paper. I would print out a new version, and he would go into the room, and I would close my laptop and go back to waiting nervously in the corner. So we went back and forth several times and managed to eliminate each of these pieces of text. And I sent the final text in. He and the other four went through it. They came back and they said, we've asked each of the parties to nominate one person to come in and review the text with us. So the two of them went in and reviewed the text and then came out. And we were given the instructions to go back to the Serena Hotel to develop a preamble to the agreement, to finalize the agreement, and to come back within a couple of hours and the the deal was going to be signed in Harambe House. So we raced back to the Serena Hotel. We sat out on the veranda in the Serena Hotel. We went through. One of the communications staff from the UN wrote a preamble, beautiful preamble. We patched it all together and we got copies of the draft of the agreement and back we went to Harambe House. So we now had the text of the agreement in a big leather binder, and they had the dais out. Kabaki and Ryla were there. All of the other advisors were milling around, very uncomfortable that their principals were about to sign an agreement that they had not seen 
and I walked onto the dais. The inspector general of police was there, very tall, imposing fellow. And he stared down at me and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I have the agreement. And he sort of looked at me and stepped back and sort of I tucked away and hid behind one of the flags on the dais. And at the appointed time, handed the agreements to Mr. Anan and the parties signed. And their own delegations didn't see the final agreement until after both President Kibaki and Raila Odinga had publicly signed them and shaken hands. In all successful negotiations, there is give and take. Invariably, some supporters on each side feel that their negotiators gave too much. To those people in Kenya, I would say this, compromise was necessary for the survival of this country. Support this agreement, for it is the key to the unity of Kenya. So the agreement included a grand coalition government. It included the creation of a position of prime minister. It included power sharing across the cabinet. And it included commitments to consult and essentially collaborate together. It wasn't, in the end, a massively detailed coalition agreement. It wasn't 60 pages long. It was a few pages long. So I do think that Anand was really deeply committed to the principle of responsibility to protect and certainly guided by so many of the tragedies and failures that he had seen in peacemaking in his time at the UN, not only as secretary general, but as the head of peacekeeping operations in the 1990s, particularly in the face of the tragedy of the Rwandan genocide and in action there. I think following this process, many of the lessons that I learned became kind of a North Star in terms of some of the things that I would aspire to in other processes. But I have never been in a process where the stars aligned the way they aligned in Kenya. This process was a master class in how you manage and orchestrate a whole range of different channels and experts and options and leverage in a way that was elegant and determined and brought absolutely everything behind a single process. But even as I say a single process, it was many, many, many processes happening in different spaces, but all being leveraged by Anan and the panel in the same direction at the same moment. And so I think that that's one of the biggest lessons is that when you have the force of will and the regional and international support to actually make that happen, it can work and it can be extraordinary. That was Meredith Preston McGee. She spent her entire career working to resolve conflicts around the world. Preston McGee is currently the Secretary General for the Global Center for Pluralism in Canada. The Negotiators is a production of Doha Debates and Foreign Policy. Season 3 wraps up this week. Catch up by finding the show wherever you get your podcasts. You've been listening to On Shifting Ground, produced in partnership with KQED, with funding from listeners like you. Today's episode was produced by Elise Manukian and Andrew Stelzer. It was mixed and mastered by Matteo Schimpf. Additional production and engineering were provided by Rob Spade. KQED's Jim Bennett is our technical supervisor. Jared Sport is our executive producer. Philip Yun is CEO of World Affairs. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ray Suarez. Thanks for listening.